Um, so look, pop your questions in there. Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Ben will, um, will certainly keep an eye on it for me as well. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll plug in some questions uh, every now and then to, to obviously keep it as, as interactive as possible. Um, I'd love, love for you guys to interact with us. Um, the session's not only just about me talking to um, Reg and Phil, it's, um, it's also the opportunity for you guys to ask questions. We've got to, uh, as you'll know very shortly, and some of you may already know some very, um, some very good guests here. So um, we'll kick into it. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to um, our two guests that we have on tonight. Um, first one being Reggie Good, um, Paniki Premier, or ex-Paniki Premier player, I should say. Hurricane uh, Wellington Lions player, um, and Thuy, who's a um, long time servant of, of OBU. Um, so look, thank you very much guys um, for jumping in tonight. So um, Bridge, do you wanna uh, introduce yourself in a little bit more detail and I uh, guess your background a wee bit, mate? Um, mute yourself too. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, Reggie Goods. Um, went to Wanda College, um, played some rugby. Well, played my rugby there, and then um, after school went to Pornicky. Um, been involved with Pornicky yeah, since 2010 till play. My last game was 2016, and um, yeah, went to Lions since 2010 till 2016 or oh, 17 or oh, 16. And then, um, yeah, Hurricanes 2012, 2016. So, retired in 2016 due to head knocks. And still involved in um, coaching around, yeah, Pornicky Colts. Just assisting there and um, helping around the scrums there, the whole of Pornicky and um, around a couple of schools. Cool. Thanks very much, mate. And um, the other guest we have is um, long-time OBU servant, Tavili. So, um, Tavili, do you want to give us a little bit of background about yourself, mate? Um, yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, Philly is um, affectionately known. Uh, go by many different names, but uh, we'll just go with Philly tonight. Um, went to St. Pat's Town. I really only played two or three games for St. Pat's Town first 15. Um, but yeah, born and bred in Wellington. Um, started at OBU in 2006. Um, and had a couple of stunts overseas here and there. Um, but yeah, uh, found a home at OBU. Um, and I guess for those who've refereed uh, me before, you guys know that I live for scrums. Um, don't live for running around the field. Uh, but that rest time at scrums uh, is definitely the most enjoyable time for me. So, yep. And you, and you certainly love to tell us uh, when we're getting some things wrong at scrum time, don't you, Philly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I've got to pick it up now that uh, Finbar's left, so... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so once again, uh, big thank you to, for both of you. Um, you've both got young families, so uh, luckily they're both, well, hopefully all, all down asleep, mine inclusive. Uh, but it's, it's really appreciative of you uh, taking the time out to come speak to us. I already see um, one question in the chat about... Um, not understanding what TED stands for, uh, Training Education and Development Session. Um, so thanks, thanks for that, Scott. Um, so we'll, we'll crack onto it, um, hopefully. So the first thing I wanted to talk about tonight um, was, was quite an interesting one, and um, I'll get Rich and Philly to kind of lead this, um, because it's very much so a player's background point of view, um, where I think us as referees can, can really get some really good insight on. Um, is the, the difference between player roles at scrum time. So the difference between uh, what a loose head prop um, might be trying to achieve uh, versus a tight head prop and what they might be um, trying to achieve. So um, I'll let one of you boys start off, uh, take your pick. Um, but do you guys just want to give us a, a rundown on, I guess, the different roles, maybe starting with loose head? Um, and what, what the Lucy is certainly trying to achieve at scrum time in their, in their main role. And then uh, we'll move, move forward from there. I'll start. So um, with, with Lucy prop, basically your role is on your scrum. So when it's your ball, um, basically I was playing and this, this role I'll teach as well is 
you try to keep stable, have a good, decent hit, and keep uh, the scrum solid. Because um, basically, the hooker, or most, or 99% of teams now, or New Zealand, basically 100%, they hook the ball between the loose head's legs. So if there's too much movement from the loose head, um, if, if it, that means the ball can get quite messy. So basically, our loose head just wants to hit and keep a strong position on our ball. When the ball's on the back, he can, you know, you can start. Do, but still keep it steady. But when the tidy goes forward, then you start moving forward with the tidy. Um, but for Lucy, his real attacking mentality is an opposition ball. Yeah. So um, when it's opposition balls, you're you're quite an attacking weapon in a scrum. Because if you, before you might elaborate on this, is um, a tidy is actually going. He's in between a hook. He's scrummaging against a hooker and a Lucy prop. So there is a chance to put pressure on a tight head, but it um, doesn't always happen. It means that the tight head is. <laughs> um, if it's for you, it's a bit harder. But um, so, yeah, opposition scrum, you're looking at attack on your own ball. You're trying to keep it steady. Yeah, steady. Solid. Yeah, just following on from that, um, the tight head is a little bit the same. Um, whenever you have your own put into the, to the scrum, all you want to do is manipulate the ball to where you want it to go. So, say if we set up on the left-hand side of a field, um, you'd want to get the tight head side up um, just so that the ball is easier to clear to your back line or, you know, vice versa. Um, when it's opposition ball, they'll be wanting to control the, the scrum to get the ball to where they need it to go. And that's where um, we would look at an opportunity to disrupt um, them getting the ball to where they want it. So... Yeah, normally on attack, it's unless you've got an um, incredibly dominant scrum, we wouldn't um, opt to you know, walk over the top of another scrum. Um, you would just be trying to get the ball to where you want it. And then any time the ball is not your feed, that's free game. And you can work hard to get that ball back. So that's, that's quite interesting. Because, um, you know, as, as, as referees, we, we do look at the loose head quite a lot. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting because obviously Reggie talked about the, the loose head is there to create stability at scrum time. So I guess we as referees, when we're, when we're looking at the loose head, if we're not getting stability, um, it's a good thing that, that we're looking at the loose head straight away because if, if it's not the loose head giving us problems, it's, it's somewhere else. Would I be correct in saying that? Oh, I'm not playing. <laughs> 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 uh-huh. Uh, just a, a lever on the, on the loose set. Um, so, oh, when hurricanes and lions, we get we get taught is a a tight is like an airplane landing. So when you engage the scrum, you basically you're going straight, but you kind of want to put pressure and scrum like pin the loose set. So he's hinged like this, mm. where loose set is an airplane taking you off. So he basically wants to go opposite direction and pop a tight head. So um, I think you know when the scrum collapses, you know it's it is, you can probably, you know, a lot of refs do play, um, point it at the, at, the loose, at the loose head, unless it's definitely the tight head. Yeah. But um, it's kind of like that battle. You kind of, like loose heads now, they accept, you know, if, if I'm going to ground, it's a 80% chance it might be against me, that penalty, you know? So, yeah. Um, which is nothing against referees. It's, to be honest, looking from the outside, if a ref's refing a game, and I'm watching it live, say on TV, and in a split second, I can't make a judgment, but it's easy to do on the replay. So I guess ref is in that position. So if you make a call, make a call. So no hard feelings. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd definitely um, give away less penalties than Finbar. Um, <laughs> I don't know no if comment. that's a discipline thing, but um, yeah, I, I think the loose head. Definitely gets the rougher ride. Um, there are instances where the tight head can manipulate the scrum to collapse. Um, but, yeah. Generally, if the loose head is aiming to go straight and then up, um, then normally the, you know, the scrum won't collapse. It'll normally go up instead of go down. Yeah. Because if you're talking about, you know, um, the, the loose head... So was it the loose head landing and the tight head going up? Oh, no, no, the, loose head uh, the way around, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. 
those those forces are obviously going against each other, which which in reality, mm. if, if the forces are the same, should keep that what we we talk about is is nice and square and, and stable. But if if there's one force that's obviously stronger than the other, from a tight head's point of view, he's going to put pressure on the on the loose head compared to um, the loose head putting pressure on the tight head, and the tight head's popping. Mm. I think the difficulty with that is that you also have to take into account that the tight head has got the hooker on them as well. Um, but that allows a tight head to stabilise a lot better because, you know, you can put your weight on two people as opposed to the loose head who has only got that shoulder, you know, that one shoulder and then they're reaching across. Yeah. Um, so it actually can shift their their point and that's why the scrums go sideways quite a lot is because they would normally follow the direction of where their head's going. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, there's always there's so many different elements that could mm. change a scrum. It really is a, a bit of a dark art, I guess. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of things, um, a loose head, like a big thing nowadays with new laws, um, or not so new anymore, is um, when a loose head engages, if he's too extended, that will most likely cause a collapse. Mm. So you see it with yeah. a lot of loose heads that's kind of leaning over the cliff. And they yeah. get a massive hit and collapse. It's just yeah. they can't catch their feet quick enough. Yeah. Do you just want to elaborate on what you mean by um, extension, Rich? So um, basically, we're looking at this. If you look at a clock and you had to put the, you know, the what do you call it, the legs on the clock is, you know, a one o'clock angle between the, the thigh and the calf. It's like a one o'clock, so 120 degrees when a when it becomes too extended, like straight legged, like there's no way you can stay on your feet, stay on your feet. Yeah. At least you catch your feet real quick. And sometimes from a hit, it just happens too quick to catch your feet, which causes a lot of collapse nowadays. Yeah. Um, it happens when teams are unbalanced in a setup. Um, if the gap's too big or yeah, at least his feet are way too big. Oh, way, you know, too extended yeah. from the start. So yeah. Yeah, that's a quite a big thing, yeah. No, that's cool. Um, anything specific from a hooker's point of view? I know, Rich, you played um, a little bit of hooker back at um, back in college. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. Sorry, if you've had any experience at hooker, mate, probably not. <laughs> no, I've known a few hookers in my time, though. I think for me, um, when you look at a scrum, the idea of a hooker, you should be able to just take the hooker out. Um, yeah. and have a scrum with prop two props. And that's, you know, that means you, as a tight head, you're focusing on the loose head and vice versa. So in theory, you should be able to just take the hookers out um, if you had a had a really good setup. Um, mm-hmm. But then, you know, what's saying that once you add that other element to the, to the scrum, it does make it that much more... You know, just yeah. that little bit more power, that faster trigger, that, you know, a bit more, um, what's the word, uh, ability to manipulate the centre of the scrum. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts, yeah. Reg? Yeah, um, with hookers, when you coach, this is from, yeah, you know, say, top level down to club and things. The main objective on your ball, you need to hook that ball. You need to have an accurate hook. Get mm-hmm. the ball to the back as your first job. And then straight after the hook, it has to be quite a fast hook. Because while you're hooking, you don't have any power going through your legs because you're one foot in the ground. And you kind of bend it as well. So you're trying to get a quick hook and then get back into scrum position and, you know, have generate some power. Um, nowadays, an opposition ball, there's, there's not many opposition hooks. So... When I, when I give advice to hookers on hooking, don't even try to hook. You know, you're better off just to keep your, both your feet in the ground. And when a ball comes in, when a hooker's in, in a hooking position, so one foot in the ground, you, got, you just generate a lot of pressure for that middle of the scrum. There's just a way better chance. Because, um, you know, with, with the fees and things, you can't say it's perfectly in the middle. It's not going to be a 50-50 strike for both hookers. You know, and it's all, you have to stand on your, what was it, between the shoulder and with the half yeah. back and put it straight in, which is fair enough. But um, it's just better for a hooker just to uh, attack opposition scrum for a push and try to hook. 
that's my opinion. No, it's um, that's that's cool. Uh, we did, actually did um, just have a question come through. Um, do superior scrums try and push opposition off the ball rather than just to hook it? Which I guess you kind of answered just before, Rich, when you talked about um, the hooker, especially when it's not your ball, just keeping your feet on your ground, keeping that scrum and, and holding that power to, I guess, try and go for the, um, the counter, right? Yep. Uh, um, in saying that, it's not... That's the most popular choice, I'm pretty sure, nowadays. Um, I know the Hurricanes Alliance, that's where they want to achieve um, at club footy. You know, you get the occasional hooker still wants to hook. And if, you know, if, if there's a chance of hooking and a you know, hooker might see, oh, I've got a chance of this, he might start hooking. But mm. most of the time, you just put your feet in the ground. I'm not, I'm not too sure what OBU does. They, they dominant pack. Yeah. They do we don't want. normally, I don't think we hook um, very often. Um, but we find that teams that we come against do because they need a hook to get their ball back. And normally it'll be a hook and the ball would be straight at the, the eights legs before we can push over the top of them. So it really depends on the strength of your scrum, I guess. Um, mm. Like you, when, you, when you get to a set piece like a scrum, you need to get the ball back, right? Because you've got to have mm. the ball to score points. And so I guess that's why we've always put such a big emphasis on scrum um, and line out um, because, you know, those big set piece players are where we get, you know, you've autom we've automatically get front football if your scrum's going forward. Um, there's already um, the advantage of having your, your, back, uh, your backs running um, set moves off scrum and line out. Um, so, yeah. I think also to answer your question before about having a dominant scrum, um, if it's your feed with the ball and you're dominant, it really depends on where you are on the field. Um, because, you know, if I was five metres out um, and it was our own ball, we wouldn't be wanting to um, use too much energy. Um, it's sort of your tactics has to come into, have to come into play as well. Um, we're conserving energy. Um, <clears throat> if you did four or five, um, back to back five meter scrums um, and not getting success, you know, that's when you also need to start looking at other options because it's quite draining yeah. for both teams uh, scrum wise if you're, if you're um, exerting that much energy and not getting the treats. So, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I think it's all just got to be in the, the time, in the moment, you just sort of got to go with your gut and do what's best at the time. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we'll we'll move on. We spent a lot of time on that, but I I certainly found that great benefit. Um, so thank thank you guys for that. Um, no other question. So we'll we'll move on. So the next the next part of the section I thought we'll talk about um, the setup of the scrum and and kind of what a referee looks for versus I guess what what players are are trying to do and trying to achieve at, at those phases of. Um, I guess a scrum and, and the setup to a scrum. So I've I've broken the scrum down into into uh, into four parts. Um, so pre crouch, crouch, bind, and set. Um, so I'll 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 kind of talk you through what a referee looks for, or certainly what my process is at scrum time, and then you can kind of talk about what um, what the players are doing and whether that either contradicts the referee or, um, you know, if, if there's anything that potentially the referee could uh, look for to, to help them get a better understanding about what's, what's going on wrong at scrum time. Um, so in regards to pre-crouch, um, from my, my process point of view, um, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll make the mark and from there we, we want to make sure that we get a, a nice gap between the front rows, uh, one that we know that when the crouch comes down that there's still going to be that nice gap um, and also we look at the props and, and how how their shoulders are making sure that they're nice and square that the shoulders aren't tucked away because from our point of view if, we, if we're seeing shoulders tucked in where we're going to be keeping a closer eye on those props because we believe that that's when they start might angling through um, so from from your guys point of view what what's what are the players Focusing on, I guess, before that crouch call. Here's go, Rich. 
Um, basically, um, it changed throughout the times when I started playing towards mm. now. But I'll talk about well, now. <clears throat> what we concentrate on is um, we're looking at getting our shoulders in line as well. Um, the the reason for that is we know when your shoulder's stuck, there's a risk of a penalty. You know, as, if you lose it, if your shoulder's stuck under your hooker, you're most likely going to bore in. Mm. This is how physics work. Yeah. So we, we're trying to get our shoulders in line now, but it's easier said than done. You know, um, that means your setup has to be right, basically. You know, you can't, where your feet are when you crouch down, because you might be in line on your shoulders, but as soon as you crouch, you might start sitting back and then you're tucked. Yeah. All these little things comes in, you know, plays a role. Um, also, the height of players. So you might have, um, say, Jeff Allen or Ben May, of 1.934 meters with Ricky Riccatelli, which is 1.73 or whatever. Yes. Now, physically, they can't get their, sh they can get the shoulders in line, but their asses won't be in line. And in the perfect world, you want your asses in line as well. So, um, the reason for that is, you know, you want your locks to scrum two shoulders. If your ass not in line for your hooker, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, your, your locks in the middle shoulder has nothing to push on. But yeah, um, makes sense. actually, I asked this to what's more important? Is your ass in line or your shoulders in line? And Mike Ron basically said, no, nah, shoulders in line first, because that's where you basically scrum is. Um, that's where you keep your, you know, straight and things like that. So, in saying that, it's, um, I'm pretty sure, well, well, I'm tr I'll club now and what I'm trying to teach is shoulders in line, but um, it doesn't always work out like that. It's, um, yeah, it depends where the prop set up, the experience of the prop, the combination between a hooker and the props. And, yeah. yeah. We, we, we obviously see a lot at club rugby and, and college rugby that, that height mismatch between... Um, between two props and, and we as referees try and manage it the best we can with, with obviously the uh, the abilities that we've got on the pitch at the time. Um, but what what are some, I guess, if we're talking pre-crouch, we're going to notice that really straight away as, as referees. So, um, and it's quite interesting that you mentioned um, obviously the height of um, of Jeff and, and Ben May um, and versus Rick Riccatelli where he's obviously quite short. So what, what techniques were, I guess, they doing to, to get those shoulders in line with, with those tall props? And is that something that we can potentially look at uh, at the lower levels to, to, I guess, manage that scrum better? Does that make sense? It's a hard one, eh? Because it's, it's up to the, the front row to get those reps in and get that repetition, you know, to train that. It's like, you'll be able to point it out on the field but for them to be able to fix that up and have an effective scrum would be difficult. Yeah. Um, but I do think I agree with Reg because um, we we um, adopt the same policy with shoulders in line. Um, obviously, the height difference between myself and Thumba um, or any of our other hookers is quite large, but when we set up for that scrum when our shoulders are in line, it means that, you know, that initial platform of the, the scrum is, is square and, and straight. So, um, yeah. Just um, want to elaborate on the shoulders in line. So, we're not doing it because we want to make the referees happy, to be honest. Um, sorry about Bruce, I want to see. But um, it's basically, it's, say, Fui and Fetu at Todd Head. When you're Lucy, when you start, you know, tucking under your if your shoulder's not in line with your hooker and you start tucking your right shoulder, first of all, you, you're probably going to bore him. But, you know, the biggest weakness for that lucid is he's got no pressure going for his right shoulder. Yeah. So, a guy like Fui or Fitu Henry, I'll just go through that gap. So, that will splice you, which means you'll either get dominated or penalised because it looks you're boring or you just get dominated, spit out the side. So, that's... That's a big reason for Lucid trying to get their shoulders aligned with Lucid and keeping their shoulder out. Yeah. And, yeah, with Todd Ed, I don't have much experience with Todd Ed, but what I'll guess is... Um, it never happens. It never happens. But <laughs> well, you might have that well, um, yeah. weakness on the inside chest, you know, where the hooker can go through or... 
Yeah, and, I guess uh, um, yeah. that inside bind for the tight head is real critical. Um, for me, I I tend not to have a real strong bind on the hooker um, on my inside shoulder. Um, and if mm-hmm. if the loose head prop is, uh, if they've got their shoulder tucked under, it actually makes it harder for me as a taller prop because um, it just narrows that channel that I could put my head in. Yeah. Um, so it has its, its, you know, its pluses and its minuses. Uh, once you do it once, um, if the prop is good enough, then you won't do it again, right? Yeah. So um, if you know, if you needed to pull um, that little trick out of the bag, um, or you're just mixing it up, because as much as uh, being a prop is a technical game, it's also a, um, a bit of a mind game, the psychological yeah. game. Um, it's definitely a, a good trick to have in the arsenal if you can do it without getting penalised. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's, um, <laughs> that's really good. Um, no questions or anything at the moment. So that's, um, that's probably overloading good. you with a uh, front row chip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you. You, you can't talk about scrums and not talk about front rows because, I mean, as, as referees, that's where we see a lot of um, our problems. And it's, I mean, I, probably generalizing a little bit, but a lot of us referees haven't really played in the front row. So uh, a lot of it is, is, is having these conversations. I know I've certainly learned, um, especially my time at Premier Level, um, learning off the likes of um, yourself, Philly, and sitting down with you and Fetu after a game and, and, and talking through Scrum. Um, so, you know, ha- having this kind of conversation is, is, is really beautiful. Um, so we'll, we'll move on, I guess, on onto the crouch. Um, so once again, I'll, I'll talk to you through my process and then you can talk through what, what, what the player's process might look like. Um, so once again, uh, making sure that on the crouch call we, we, we get a good gap. Uh, the heads are in right gaps. Um, no heads on shoulders. Uh, and then most importantly that we're, we're square and then we've got, and we've got stability. So there's, there's not too much movement in there uh, before, before we move on. Um, I guess probably a lot of those things are, are just as important for, for you, you props and, and you as front rowers. You go first, Luke. <laughs> hey, uh, for me, it's um, most of it's already done by that point. Um, once we set up for the scrum, you know, you've set the gap with the hookers. The hookers already at a three quarter set, so it means like our lower part of our body is already set. So we, by the time you're calling crouch, all I'm doing is hinging over, and you know, my legs should, and the whole front row's legs should already be in the right position. We should just be mm. able to. Um, be upright or you know however we are and then just go like that and then we're good to go yep mm-hmm. anything to add on that Rich? Um, yeah from a front row aspect it's the same but uh, main, main things you're concentrating on is balance yeah. and um, also some tactical things so if you have a tall prop you go against as a loose head I'm not saying it's going to be every club or a club game but I'm sure some loose heads will be a bit shorter and go against a tall tight head. So against Hui, you want to close yeah. the gap. You want to have a small gap as possible. You want to give them yeah. time to, you know, get set. And vice versa, a tall tight head might want to have a bigger gap, you know, so you can you throw himself in. So it is a little bit of tactics there, but laws of the game are still going to have to be a gap. Yeah. So, a gap. so you kind of just play it how the referee plays it during the game. And I think a lot of, you know, you get the occasional scrums that basically, you know, go crouch and then one scrum falls forward. And a lot of time it gets blamed on a, on a prop and things. But I think the thing behind that is the locks. You know, a lot of times, you know, because the locks got their process, they kind of put their weight through the props or the front row and they fall forward. Because the front row doesn't want to fall forward and they kind of know their balance through their training. So sometimes... You know, it's you've got to penalise someone, I guess, or free kick someone. But um, just also, if you get feedback, it could be the locks that um, triggers that forward movement, that unbalancedness. I li- so, yeah. like to think that us, us referees, especially in those in those first couple of scrums, we 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 try and talk about management and and managing those um, 
those those first couple of scrums and not necessarily blowing the whistle and, and going to those three kicks and penalties. So as you talked about in those first couple where you might have those um, that slight creeping forward um, that we ask the question, hey look, just obviously hold, hold your weight up a bit. Um, and you like, generally most 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 front rollers would tell you straight away it's the lock's fault. Mm. Um, it's always first to blame someone else anyway. So um, never his fault. Um, so it, it's it's quite it's quite nice to hear that that that's what you guys want to see as well. It's it's not just because a team's gone early doesn't necessarily mean that you know you, you feel that you're at fault and you you at least want the chance to correct yourself. Um, but obviously, if it gets to that point where we're having too many, we've got to start doing something about it. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. you've got to understand that when we train scrums, we train it to the rule. So it's yeah. not like we're going out there with the intent to um, play against the laws of the game. That like, if we're training it that way, then why would we play it any other way, right? So yeah, um, yeah. With that crouch, obviously, the important things for you guys to focus on, especially. Um, if you want to focus on um, not having heads on shoulders and whatnot on that crouch is definitely getting a, a good gap. Um, and as Reggie said, you know, it's going to close up. Like, it'll close up as people get tired. Like, we're not going to have perfect scrums through the whole game. It's just not, not how it works. Um, yeah. But as long as you can um, get a bit of consistency at least and make sure that you're, you're trying your best to keep that, that gap open, um, then, yeah. you know, there's not really much else that we can ask for. Yeah. Um, cool. I, I think that's good for Crouch. We've, we've got a few questions that um, relate to, actually, one was, one was uh, the, the pre-Crouch. Um, and, it's, and it's more talking about um, junior and college rugby. Um, so thanks, Scott, for the question. As a ref with um, junior club or college rugby, how important is it? from the refereeing point of view, to help setting up those scrums? Um, basically, preparation, you know, it's not a ref's job to coach a scrum. You know, mm. you know, a team runs up there, they should know the basics already, you know, and the ref just kind of runs the scrum, you know. It's, it's no, not going to tell a player how to set up and things. But, um, it's not gonna. It's never gonna be perfect. It might not be a shoulder in line and things as well. But I guess at the end of the day, you're just looking at good scrums mm -hmm. and fair scrums. And um, it's quite a hard one to answer. But uh, um, you know, you kind of expect that teams run out and they do have a some sort of scrum. And I guess yeah, college and young young um, kids, boys or girls, um, it's a lot about safety as well. You don't want to have the collapses and like you know big dominant scrum, you know nailing a poor scrum or whatnot. But you know, yeah, it's more on your guys, your guys' um, yeah. knowledge how to handle that. But yeah, I mean, um, Scott, from from a refereeing point of view, um, we always talk about safety. You know, safety is paramount for for college um, and, and junior rugby. So. Uh, anything you can do to, to I guess, promote safety. Um, and, and if that means just not necessarily like physically holding a team back, but, um, you know, just blowing things up a little bit more quicker or, um, you know, just, just talking to the front rowers a little bit more just to, just to promote that safety, I think you, you, you'll get better outcomes um, and potentially a better game of rugby than um, leading one team either completely destroy um, another. Um, I mean, that, that's all I can really talk about from a yeah. point of view. Isn't there a rule with a 1.5 metre thing as well? Yeah, yeah, they the do. Yep. Yeah. But you still dominate a team in that if you need to. Yeah. If you're really dominant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, um, another, another comment from um, Mark. Um, great photo of, of a scrum sitting up in the wet. Um, is there anything different that a scrum will do differently in the wet versus, um, versus firm ground? Mate, <clears throat> I'm definitely not a fan of the old wet scrums. Um, a prop like Reggie would take me apart in the, in the wet <laughs> scrum. So normally, um, 
for me, you know, your grip's not as good. Um, normally, I'd be trying to just uh, close that gap as much as I can um, to reduce the hit and then just try and hold position. Um, it's really hard, especially when you've got long levers to extend out and, um, you know, get into that 120, as uh, Reggie was saying, that getting that perfect pushing position. Um, it's pretty unrealistic and wet in club rugby or school or junior rugby at all. So um, I definitely think closing that gap up um, is better for, for player safety. Um, but yeah, that's all I got on that. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. It's work ground and stuff. You know, it's um, the only difference between wet and firm ground is your sprigs. That's the only change you could make, really. Mm. Um, 21s compared to 18s, but or some people just always wear 21s. But yeah, when the ground's so muddy and you just keep slipping, there's nothing you can do, I guess. Uh, when you talk about grass. 21s versus 18s, region, I assume you're talking sprig size. Sprig size, yeah, 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 yeah. The biggest, the biggest sprigs you're allowed, eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Two point one inch, or what? No, no, it's not two point one inch. Twenty one inch. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. Um, 22.1 we'll, centimetre. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll move on to the uh, the next part of the scrum, which is um, which is obviously the, the bind call from, from the referee. Um, so from, from my point of view, my process is very similar to the crouch. Uh, once again, making sure that we, we've still got that gap, no heads on shoulders, um, ideally. Um, that we're nice, square, we're stable. It was good, got good fine. And I, I specifically look for tight fine. Um, and then also the number eight. And so this is um, a very good picture of, of what I wouldn't like to see from number eight at, at, at Scrum Club. Um, so from, from a player's point of view um, and, and from a front row point of view, I, I guess from talking about uh, the crouch, the bind's very similar for you guys, wouldn't it? No, I reckon that's a, another kettle of fish for the bind. Caught me through it, mate. So, obviously, with the heads off shoulders these days, it means there's a lot more uh, focus on the bind. Um, so, for me, with the, the new rules, um, it's important to get all of that weight through the bind. So, my bind actually has to be long and it has to be strong. Because yeah. um, what else happens there is you, um, if your knees have the, if your locks have their knees on the ground, normally your knees come up, all of the weights put on. So the, effectively, you've got the weight of your scrum going through the two props arms onto the other scrum. Um, so yeah, it's quite a it's quite a big movement in terms of you know the momentum of your scrum that whole setup the amount of weight that you can put on. Um, your Lucy's will normally not be pulling back anymore. They'll be leaning on as well. Um, so your, your flankers on the sides, um, normally in the setup, they'll be, you know, they have their hand looped over the person's hip. Normally that comes off and they're leaning on um, ready for that hit. So um, it's a massive change of energy, I guess. Mm. Uh, with that bind, just to add on to that, is <clears throat> you've got all this weight going through the binds of the props, um, basically for their arms because they can't have their head on shoulders. Um, when it was head and shoulders, it was way easier. Yeah. But now it's going through your arms. But still, like uh, aim of a team. So ideally, you want to put this weight through your bind onto another team, but have about mm. you know twenty percent more weight onto them. Yeah, you know, so they kind of on their heels, on their heels, and you're on, you know, the front of your feet. Yeah, which basically means you're going to win that. Yeah, you know, you, it's like a sprinter. You kind of you're ready to sprint, push off, and you know, start your sprint. If you're on the heels, you know, you're going to be a bit slower. Yeah. So um, yeah. that's the real technical bit of that. And I think sometimes teams they take a bit far and they might, you know, push too much, and the other team goes back and there's free kicks. So. Um, Maybe I'm just talking from you know, from the hurricanes. From hurricanes' point of view, they kind of just want to have that little bit of upper hand on the lean, going through those shoulders. But um, I think sometimes in a you know, club footy game, that's yeah, 
will probably be a thing a lot of teams will want to do. It's way more common than probably win it scrum by the bind. Yeah. I think yeah. when you look at our scrum, Jamie, um, especially from our scrum sessions through the preseason, um, once I could get a full bind on someone, it, it would affect their hit completely. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I certainly noticed that. Yeah. Um, cool. We'll, we'll we'll move on to set because um, just getting some time calls. It's um, we're, we're, we're it's nearly hitting forty five minutes, but I I know I'm certainly getting a lot out of this, and I, I hope the rest of you guys are too. Scott, I know you got a, um, Scott Merrin. I know you got a question there. I'll, I'll ask it shortly, mate, because um, I I think it will um, it will help with the set. Um, so from the set point of view, from from a refereeing point of view, my, my process is, is, is very similar. Um, once again, you uh, the same similar trends, that we've got stability, that the binds are still strong, um, that, we're, that we're square and that we see a, a straight push, or at least that, that the scrum goes forward first. Um, I guess from the set point of view, from a front, from, from a front rise, you that's where you, you go to work. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So from that set, I believe on we call about the dominoes, and for you probably heard the dominoes thing as well. It's basically come down the hurricanes through schools now, and the whole hurricanes region is basically you follow your setup, then the crouch, then the bind, and then the set. But you've got to get every single one right. So say so if you get set up, your set up wrong, you might not have or your crouch wrong, you might not have a good you know, bind or whatnot. So, um, you know, from the set point of view, you want to get a good hit. You want to, as a prop, yeah. you want to dominate that. And your chances are somewhat better to have a good controlled scrum or a dominant scrum if you get an upper hand on the hit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, honestly, yeah, as props or front row, you try, you want to go straight. You want to go straight. But for loose set, it's a lot, it's a bit harder than it. It's, they're just saying it because um, you got your head under a tightish, you know, chest. The natural movement is that you know you are going to go a bit in, mm. which is is it. And if you want to go straight, your head has to literally be outside. It's a, you know, that's yeah. the true physics. But um, there's ways I try to teach Lucy's now, keeping square, doing the same thing. But um, it all comes back into the shoulders and line. Um, with the hooker, yeah. Just um, one little thing on that loose head, you know, with the scrumging straight. I had a talk. Oh, Dan Cron had a talk to us around what refs look at, look at. Or like, so I think it was Mike Fraser or Ben O'Keefe or someone. They look at a good way to look at it is that number one on a prop. Yeah, it has to be in line with the hooker's back. So uh, we train that as well. So we look yeah, at the one. That, that's certainly a trigger for myself. Is, is, um, looking at the numbers on the back uh, certainly gives you a good picture of where that where that body shape is. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess um, the set is an opportunity for you to um, to win that hit as well uh, for us. But it's also um, you know uh, it's a good time to um, to make sure that all your your triggers and stuff are in place. Um, mm. And, you know, that's where we would make sure that once we've hit that we're keeping that weight on. Yeah. Um, and I think something that I've preached to you um, and probably a few other refs um, who are watching is um, we try to just paint that picture as well. Um, like, you want to have the three in line. So normally I'm like, you know, if we paint you the picture where we've got um, the three three in line like this is that what you want um and normally uh, as the scrum manipulates we just try and keep our three in line um which you know shows that that picture of us having a um pushing straight you don't necessarily have to push for like you know you can be pushing around on the angle as long as yeah. everyone is is in line and that's yeah. was that the picture that you guys are looking for or I, ideally, um, we uh, we understand that every time we're, we're going to call set, we might get 
a slightly different picture. But if we, if we gain stability and we can see that there's a there's at least a square picture there, um, we, we we can get a pretty good understanding about where things might go wrong. Um, yeah. Or if we're not getting that and and something doesn't look um, quite like the right picture. Um, then we're going to be a little bit more focused on on that. So, as pure examples, obviously, if if that loose head one is, is 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 quite on an angle, we're going to be watching what he's doing and what and where he's going, and then how that's affected the scrum. Um, and there might be times where nothing happens. He's just set up there. He's set up strong. Um, he's not exactly chasing that angle, um, and we might be okay with that. Um, it might be that the next run we just might say, hey, look, you've, you've set up really, really on an angle. We just want you to square up a wee bit. Um, it might have been that that loose head might have got his set up slightly wrong. Where that, that's also why um, I think from a referee's point of view, it's, it's really good to, to communicate with the front row and, and, and get an understanding about what they've done compared to what we're seeing. Um, so it might not necessarily need to be a penalty. It might be just that. He goes, look, I've got it slightly wrong. Okay, cool. And he fixes it that next run. It might be, you know, that he was actually trying to do something illegal because he was getting beat or, you know, one of, one of those things. Yeah. Um, so we've just hit the 45-minute mark. Um, I did have some video clips to show, but um, Ben just advised me that he's got a few questions that um, he'll, he'll cover off. Um, now, so what we'll do is um, we'll do the Q&A that he's got um, and if there's any kind of last questions um, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up from here unless I get an overwhelming response from the chat that they want to see video clips and hear you guys talk about video clips. If, if I don't hear anything, we'll, we'll just skip that and, and wrap up. So Ben, do you want to take over, mate? Yep. Um, yeah, mate. I've had a couple of questions come through to me. Um, can Fui and Reach just kind of cover off what the roles of the other, of the locks, the flankers and the number eight are in a scrum and how that kind of impacts on stability? You go first, Fui. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess everyone's quite um, crucial, especially if you... Um, if you look at the scrum as a whole, um, you actually need the whole scrum to be working together to be successful. Um, and I think you'll find um, when you watch a couple of the clubs who um, don't have um, strong scrums, it's actually because there's a disconnect between, um, you know, the front row, what the second row is doing, um, if their triggers are here or there, the looses are not bound on, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, for me, I guess... You know, your locks are pretty much your glue. Um, in the middle, um, they're your workhorses. So, like, as much as I like to say that I do the most work in the scrum, um, I feel like the locks, you know, without the locks there, um, I wouldn't have the same, um, what's the word? Effectiveness. <laughs> it's not even a word, is it? Um, but, you know, without the locks there, they, they hold us together in the middle. Um, for me, the flankers as well, um, if they're not holding you back on the set, um, normally they're sort of angling inwards a little bit um, just to keep those hips in um, of the props. So um, sometimes you'll see that flankers are angling quite heavily in on the prop just to keep those hips in. And then your number eight and your hooker would normally work in tandem as a trigger. Um, so on your set call, um, they'll be both triggering at the same time with their feet. Um, to get into like a square position um, so that the whole scrum just hits at the same time. Um, got anything else on that, Reg? Yeah, um, just what we said around the locks. Um, you know, with, with the front row, basically you can manipulate a scrum with your little tricks and all that kind of jazz and you also push, but then you've got the locks in behind you, which is the engine. They're kind of driving that force behind you and then they get that bit of help from the eight and the loose forwards. As well, but um, looking, you know, locks. Well, I talked around that balance. Sometimes they come up and they put put too much pressure, you know, through the props and they fall forward. More top level is um, you know, eight is working as that valve, so he kind of he's he does a lot of the balancing of a scrum. 
So he's holding at locks and he kind of controls how much locks he puts through when they come up and things like that. And then um, when the locks are up, he's also a trigger um, with the hooker. So he fires at locks in. So, yeah, that's, that's all I can add. Cool. Thank you. Um, next one. How important is cadence in terms of scrum call? Like just for that, I think um, he means would you rather the same cadence for every scrum or does it depend on your, your setup, making sure you're stable? How is that important for a front rower? I might take that one too, Reg. Yeah, go for it. Um, <laughs> for me, it doesn't really um, matter as much. Um, as long as the, um, you know, when you crouch in the bind, um, as long as there's a, a bigger pause between the bind and the set, um, because sometimes when that stuff comes on too quick, it makes it quite dangerous. Um, and yeah, you know, that's uh, on the bind also is all, uh, probably the biggest chance that the scrum's going to stuff up if the bind is not being done properly. Um, so it's actually quite good, I think, especially at, at premier level to. Um, you know, not have the same cadence all the time because then you know some teams will be able to preempt the um, that set where you know you can almost keep everyone a little bit more honest and waiting on your call um, if you mix it up a little bit. I don't know what Reggie thinks about that, but um, you know, I'm, I've always been one to back my timing, so I'm I'm not not against it or um, for it, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm with you on that. Is you know, a ref always says before the game, you know, it's gonna after the bind when it's a steady old call set or not, and yeah, I'm happy with that. You know, it makes it a fair contest. As a loose set, sometimes you do struggle to get your bind because um, you kind of go and you go below the tightest arm, so yeah. sometimes it's quite hard to get your bind first up. So yeah, you might even need a second grab at it. And if you call set without the second grab, you got no bind. And that's a collapse, you know. So, yeah, just yeah, ref, call it what you see, not not by the routine. Yeah. I'd, I'd I'd back that too, Rich. Um, I, I I can imagine from if if we were having a cadence, we could run into a little bit of trouble as well because if we're trying to follow the same pattern from a refereeing point of view, count, um, calling crap by set, you know, um, in that bind call, you might not have resetted your feet correctly and then we're calling set and you're halfway through that reset of your feet and that's when you you, you could be losing your feet and we could be collapsing the scrum so if, if we're if we're waiting for um the right setup from the teams and that we we've got that stability um i think that's that's really crucial because what i've heard over the what what we've talked about in terms of the phases of a, of a setup of a scrum stability is really important and being um being stable. Um, so giving you guys the opportunity to, to do that um, is, is better than having a, a set cadence. Yeah, it's also an opportunity for you guys to tick boxes, eh? Because yeah. I think for me, I'm always going through the scrum setup process and I'm ticking boxes, like making sure that my setup is right, making sure my bind's yeah. good, making sure my lock's in the right place. Yeah. You know, hookers calling people and all that sort of stuff, listening out for you, what you guys are doing. So as yeah. long as you guys are happy and you're ticking the right boxes um, for your, you know, what makes you happy with scrums, then, you know, yeah. we're more than happy to um, just follow your lead. Cool. Um, uh, two other ones. Uh, um, Scott in the chat um, has asked a technical question. Is it correct that the number eight combined between the lock and the flanker instead of both locks? Um, at... The DSLVs, which is all your junior rugby and college levels, no. Um, they must bind between the flanker, oh, sorry, between the locks. Um, and if so, can they change the bind after the ref's call set? Again, that's quite technical. Um, if you're at international rules, the scrum doesn't actually start until the ball's in. Um, so as long as they have changed before the balls in there, actually legally allowed to, I believe. Um, while she can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and the last question for Philly is, um, 
is your um, smoke detector working? It looks a bit sad. Uh, no, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Who asked that? <laughs> uh, that's a good one, though. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, look, I think we'll call, I think we'll call it there. I haven't seen any overwhelming um, calls for looking at video clips. So, um, look, it's probably where you're going uh, wrong, Jamie. Uh, yeah, probably. But I, I really appreciate both your time tonight. Um, and like I said, taking the time out to, to come and speak to us. Um, I certainly got a lot of benefit out of it. Um, and I know probably a lot of the referees that we have on tonight's call would have um, got some benefit out of it too. So uh, I, I can't thank you enough. So I really do appreciate it. Um, but last but not least, I'd like to thank also um, our sponsors. Um, you know, we've all gone through a bit of a hard time. So do, do your bit to, to get in touch with them and, and, and help them out because um, just as much as, as we need help in this time, um, but those local businesses certainly do. Um, need your help as well. So, um, look, if you guys have any um, any questions that come to you throughout the week that you want answered, you're more than welcome to get in contact with myself. Um, if you want me to pass them on to um, Reg or Fui, um and ask them directly, I'm more than happy to pass those on to um, through to you guys as well. Um, other than that, look, have a have a good Monday night. Um, there is a session, a Zoom session with the Auckland referees who are talking to Alama Uramira. Is that right, Ben? Correct. Yep. Tomorrow. Um, so if you want to hear Alama talk um, with the Auckland Referees Association, well, there's, there's that uh, tomorrow night. Um, I don't know if New Zealand Rugby are doing another one this Thursday, but I'm sure we'll get notification through uh, who's the ref and obviously Facebook about those. Yeah, New, Zealand Rugby that, is, New Zealand Rugby's doing one on Thursday. They've got, uh, I think it's Paul Williams interviewing Yako Piper. Cool. Um, other than that, look, feedback is bliss, guys. Um, if you've got any feedback, please send it through to, um, Dad's going to hate me for this, appointment um, at wra.org.nz. Um, and look, we're trying to shape these sessions for you guys. This is obviously the first one. Um, please let us know what you like, what you didn't like, um, what you might like to see, and we'll, we'll, we'll structure these sessions um, so that you guys can get benefit out of it. So hopefully we can, when it comes time that we're, we're back out on the road, we feel that we're, um, we're equipped and that we've hopefully learned something through this process. Just on that, um, Jamie, um, sorry. Yeah, you if you do happen to referee one of us in the game as well and you have questions, um, feel free to just hit us up after the games or, and we're more than happy to give you some feedback too. Cool. Hey, look, thanks very much, guys. Um, have a safe, safe night. Um, oh. Keep safe, stay home, save lives, all that stuff. Sorry, Jamie, can I just quickly say oh. something? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, no, just um, it. Sorry, I'll ground off after this. Um, just from me and Fui or from all the rugby players, I know if but you guys get a lot of slack on the field from front rowers or any player, you know, for you know, refereeing the game. But with, without the refs, you know, in this region, it's kind of can't make the game game, ha game happen. So um, just for all the work you guys do throughout college and club rugby and all that kind of jazz, all the stuff, guys and girls. Cool. Thanks very much, team. Catch you later. See you. See you later. Are we still live to people? Yep. Yeah.